All right, welcome everyone. We're Semblance of Sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And we're here for a podcast number, number 41. 41. All right, and this one is going to be about three things, Jacob. Mm-hmm. But, three things that we would like to tell our past selves. Yeah. If we and, could, we would. And this is something that is not really a story-based thing, but in a lot of ways it is because it's a lot of our a disclosure story. of our story yeah. and telling you mm-hmm. a kind of a brief inlet into what our past has been like and also just kind of things that we would take as being wisdom that in a lot of ways either anime or the channel Mm -hmm. or just our experience up to this point has taught us and we would love to pass it on to our 10 years ago or just past self in Uh general so we each have three things that we'll be Mm -hmm. going over but first off we have to give a shout out to one of our Mm -hmm. vips that recently uh started uh, supporting us on vip thank you so much you're awesome dude your name is michael uh make sure i don't butcher this michael zhenkevich uh i believe that's polish it's awesome awesome last name but thank you so much for your support dude it means a whole lot it really does mean a lot yeah Yeah. so appreciate you dude and now are three things each. So how do we want to do this, Jacob? They're like one of each going back and forth, or do we want to kind of go over yours and then go over mine? Uh, sure, let's let's do it. Uh, let's do it. Oh yeah, I can go first. Sure. Um, okay. So, uh, so the first thing I would want to tell myself is to fail as fast as I possibly can. Okay. So what is that? And explain what that means. The, like to unpack, unpack that. that. The okay. We learn from our failures, right? And failure in and of itself is actually a very good thing because that helps teach us where to go. And the idea that a lot of times um, when the when we don't make progress, that's not because we're doing things badly, but rather because we're afraid of failure, right? Uh, and because of that, we don't sure. end up doing anything. Yeah. Whereas if we basically not just learned to accept failure, but that we should actually be not not seeking it out, like aiming to, to fail kind of a thing, but so not be afraid of it that we just charge forward and then learn as fast as we can on the way. Because right. speed really is important. Like, yeah with say the book for instance right one of the reasons that i see a lot of people that don't end up finishing their stories and the reasons that like past stories that i had didn't end up getting finished was because i didn't fail quickly right i didn't i I didn't develop that that. idea of basically saying okay turn off the internal editor just go forward and you know i even struggle with this now as i'm getting closer to the like when this book is going to be done and i can release it is like okay all right i need to not get hung up on the details and just do pass through after pass through and eventually it'll all get cleared up yeah um, that's really good but, for failing yeah. as fast as you can i feel like that's another thing that uh people can get caught up in the idea of their own kind of self-talk kind of telling mm-hmm. them that they are a failure yeah. because they have failed right. at some point in the past mm-hmm. when in actuality failing is the biggest opportunity for you to grow and change right and learn things in general so that's yeah. really cool yeah we had some awesome have some awesome parents that uh, always told us to basically you know fall forward as they mm-hmm. like to call it yeah but even then as a kid you don't really you don't really get what they mean by that that's true like, that's like, true you don't and then it's like oh Crap! Why didn't I like? Why didn't I pick up on that yeah, why didn't so I pick long up ago? On that? How, oh, how that's a good point. That was. Yeah, yeah, I was definitely afraid of failure as a kid yeah. a lot. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so that would be my encouragement to you guys: is to fail like crazy yeah. um, and enjoy it. The next thing that I wish I could tell, tell myself is that consistency is king. Because yeah. the times when you're like, say, working on something. Like, say, my earlier stories that I would be working on, right? Oh, and I'd be yeah. like, oh, I'm not making progress or, you know, whatever. And then Usually, you'd hop over to the other story or uh-huh, something. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and I would never get anything done. Usually that's because right. I wouldn't be consistent with it. Same mm-hmm. thing with, like, working out or anything worthwhile, really. Mm-hmm. When you're not consistent with it, you don't end up seeing the progress that you're actually making, and then you end up stopping right when maybe you were about to break through and have some really cool stuff start happening. I feel like that's something that the channel in particular has taught me a lot, is oh, that yeah. consistency is way more important than almost mm-hmm. anything else. Because, I mean, if you're if you're willing to just be consistent with it... Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually things will will yeah. you know at least give you an opportunity for growth change and or just a learning experience right and yep. uh, consistency being king i like your choice of words there because mm-hmm. it means kind of above all else right like it it you really can't stress it enough like that like a lot of times when you know again with like writing or something Mm -hmm. i would think like okay i'm gonna do like a burst and do like a stint for some amount of time and having short goals like that can be helpful but then when those would be done i would stop 
Right. And then you're basically... like, I have no more goals. Right, so. right, right. Yeah. Or, or I burn myself out or whatever. Right. right. As opposed to basically saying, okay, every single day I'm going to take steps, you know, in some measurable, you know, direction. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. And, and what's your third one? The third one is that you can do anything. Yes, that is true. But you can't do everything. Oh. So the idea that any time you set out to do something, Ooh. you actually can do those amazing things that seem impossible. But there's going to be a cost associated with that. Gotcha. You won't be able, you know, if you want to do some crazy thing that people would say is impossible, you this. have to accept. You have to sacrifice other Equivalent things. Equivalent exchange. Exactly. <laughs> if you want to live like no one else, then you first have to live like no one else, and, and that's not really fun. A lot right. of the time. Yeah, so you need to enjoy so you need to sacrifice that. some fun. Uh huh. You, you need, need to be sacrifice. consistent yeah. with the sacrifices, you know, oh, and, and sure. understand that it's not going to be a straight journey. You will make mistakes along the way, you will fail. These but... all work really in synergy yeah, with each yeah, other. Yeah. You really thought this through. Yeah. yeah. Um so that's that's basically what I would tell tell myself and what I would cool. tell you guys. So if that helps. Yeah, I, I, I really feel like that you can do anything but not everything would have curbed a lot of the bad ego in me like mm -hmm. in my younger years as well as yeah. trying to think that i can do everything right. is kind of silly because it's obvious that on some level you're you initially reject the idea that you can do anything uh -huh. but what i think we really internalize is that it's well, you can't do ever. You can't do everything. Right. You can't do this and do this other crazy exactly. thing. And so when you tell yourself that you can do anything and you don't have that, but not everything, right. mm -hmm. you end up basically realizing that that has a nice sentiment, but it's not actually. You know, that's not true. actually all there is. That's not actually yeah. true. And yeah. then you end up basically cutting yourself short and not actually going after those Whoa. crazy big things because you're like, well, that's that's not really that's not really true. I can't actually do that. Not me. Whoa, but, so those are really cool because yeah. I, I like these. They're, they're really inspirational. The things I'm going to bring up here are more kind of emotionally based things uh -huh. that are, uh, I would say, a little less mechanical, but things gotcha. that I, I really needed to kind of tell my past self. So I took one of my favorite characters in all of animated mm -hmm. fandoms everywhere, Uncle Iroh from Avatar The Last Airbender, and I took... I took I took three things, yes, and one of them is kind of a general lesson that Iroh gives, but the other two are just straight up quotes that Iroh gives. And I, I want to kind of extrapolate what I can from these things because these are, this is what my past self needed to hear. Gotcha. The first quote is when Iroh is walking through the tunnel uh, with Aang as they're digging down to find uh, Katara and Zuko at the end of book two. And Hi Iroh says, sometimes life is like this dark tunnel you can't always see the light at the end of the tunnel, but if you just keep moving, you will come to a better place. And I see a lot of the consistency is king in uh, this yeah, one yeah. here. Mm -hmm. One of the things, though, that's really important, though, with, uh, with this quote for me in particular, mm -hmm. is I remember when I was younger, I needed to see the immediate reward slash result uh, yep. sooner. Mm -hmm. right. I couldn't delay it out long enough. Right. So there was this... this this need for instant gratification. Uh -huh. That's why a and, lot of people have problems with consistency. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So one of the ideas would be that I would go after something and then if it gave me the reward, the result, I would, ooh, I would keep mm -hmm. going. And as long right. as that would keep going, then I would stick with it. But life isn't like that. Life right. is more like a dark tunnel. You yep. have a path laid out in mm -hmm. front of you. Now, in a right. lot of ways, it kind of the metaphor doesn't hold up in airbender because they're actually Making creating the tunnel, the tunnel yeah. which i think there is something to that as well sure you are you are somewhat limited by your environmental circumstances but you are mm -hmm. also able to somewhat dig the tunnel so right. so you can change the direction mm -hmm. and stuff but ultimately you have to keep moving through the dark which right. is scary it's confusing mm -hmm. you don't know exactly where you're going to end up right and i think that's the main thing that needs to be um pointed out is that iro is a very optimistic person mm -hmm. he says this whole thing that you will come to a better place i think a lot of people see the dark tunnel oh. and assume that it's just going to be more of the same thing gotcha. that life is just the dark tunnel mm -hmm. a lot of it is the dark tunnel let me just tell you that's just that's just reality it, a lot of it is the dark tunnel but if you keep moving eventually eventually you'll come to something different at the very right. least you'll come to something better than uh -huh. just the dark tunnel something that's a little bit clearer and i think that's something that you know as i went after a whole bunch of different life goals and paths mm -hmm. and stuff like that eventually finding things that would end up having 
you know that 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 better aspect to them so yeah, yeah i needed to hear this what uh, uh, you can go on to the next one but one of the things that i just realized about that quote mm -hmm. is that it says you will come to a better place it doesn't say it's going to be that specific place that you hope you're right. moving towards but yeah. you will come to a better place but yeah, I just I think very, that's very good differentiation. That's really, really good differentiation because yeah. a lot of times we'll consider it to be a failure if we don't get to the exact place we imagine. Yes. Even if we oh. do get to an awesome place by persevering. Seriously. Uh, next one is a quote from the Lake Lao Guy episode, and this is probably one of the most impassioned moments that Iroh is yeah. ever like in the entire show. He is he is he is frustrated. He is mm -hmm. really really trying to reach Zuko in this place here. And he says, I'm begging you, Prince Zuko. It's time for you to look inward and start asking yourself the big questions. Who are you and what do you want? Now, here's That's the thing. So this is this is a very much a hero's journey kind <laughs> of section in the story where Zuko's in kind of the darker place and he's got this kind of identity split into multiple different areas. But Iroh is telling him, like, this is your time to actually, like, choose things. Now, he's telling him to ask the big questions. The who are you and what do you want things seem like the obvious questions. In fact, they almost seem a little bit cheesy when you think about yes. it in terms of anime stories and stuff. Because it's like, oh, yes, it's all about the hero and how they have to decide who they are and what, they, what, do, you, what do you want. I will tell you, this is a very sad reality that... I think that me and my younger self really didn't like because I think I realized this mm -hmm. and yeah I didn't ask I wasn't willing to consistently ask the questions gotcha is that asking the questions who are you and what do you want doesn't necessarily lead to a happy place <laughs> because you sometimes realize that you aren't really a fan of who you are in that gotcha. state and what you want isn't something that you see a very simple path to get through. There's going to be a lot of sure. pain mm -hmm. to get to the, yep. what you want. So it's somewhat self-oriented, so it can sound a little cheesy and stuff, but I feel like this is something that's huge, guys. If, it really if is. You, if you are yeah. ever in a place yeah. of confusion or just kind of an identity crisis of just trying to figure out who you are and stuff... You have to be willing to ask these questions over and over and over and over and yep. over and over yep. and over yep. again. Yep. And I'll tell you, you aren't going to find easy answers. That's just right. that's just not going to be the, the way things are. And I, I'll tell you, like, it's not that I needed to hear this quote, mm -hmm. but I need to be reminded from someone that it's okay to keep asking the question over yes. and over and over yes. again. Yeah. Because that doesn't mean anything. That's right. literally everyone's mm -hmm. place in life. No one is finding easy answers to this question. Right. But tough answers are better than no answers. Yes. Like, I'll tell you, not there are a lot of people that go through life never asking this question. Yeah. Or these questions in general. They might ask the, what do you want question? And that's about as basic as it can get sometimes, because that's mm -hmm. basically what a baby sometimes goes through. What do I want? Right. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I want Jack I Sparrow want looking at the compass yeah. and it points at the bottle of rum. You right, know? right. Yeah. But asking these questions in conjunction gets at the core of something really important. I think it was cool that Jacob and I ended up kind of asking asking kind of each other that when we realized how much of our identity and what we want is centered around stories oh. that it made sense for this channel to go the way it did so right. really cool stuff but um final one isn't really a quote but it's that iroh consistently urges zuko to embrace the struggle now this is something that you kind of talked about with failing as fast as you yes. can yes now when I say embrace the struggle, I mean get like excited about the struggle. We're all about passion, mm -hmm. right? I think you should be passionate about the idea of struggling because here's how I kind of break the meta on kind of life in this whole mm -hmm. thing is that if you're struggling, you're creating a story. Nope. If you're mm -hmm. creating a story, that means you have a resolution coming. Right. If you have a resolution coming, that means that this Whatever this struggle is, is finite. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just, it that's, doesn't go on forever. The, yeah. That's, that's yep. the thing, though. Right. Now, here's the thing I've seen a lot of people do, and this is why I needed to hear this, because I did this. I ignored the struggle. You take the struggle and you shove it away. You mm -hmm. take every, you use every coping mechanism, you use every kind of distraction or something mm -hmm. else to 
push the struggle to the side. Be like, I don't want to deal with it. I don't right. want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. Zuko doesn't want to deal with the Fire Nation. He just wants yeah. to run away from his problems mm-hmm. and chase after a dream that's not really his. Right. Distract myself. Uh, I must capture the Avatar. Well, mm-hmm. Why? Why do you have to? Uh, no, don't ask questions. Don't ask stupid right. questions. I have to do this. Yep. 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 Oh, my gosh. If you're willing to not just not just embrace the struggle but be passionate about when the struggle comes up a lot of the things that are kind of the general struggles of humanity you know it comes to fear anger you know depression and stuff those all come from a place of struggle right and if we don't flee from the struggle but we embrace it and we like make it a part of ourselves yeah, I, you'll ask like anyone out there when they talk about how the pain of their past became the right became the thing that basically was it became their, just part of their story. Right, uh, it became uh, a part of their story. Yeah, exactly there you that. go. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. embrace the struggle because the struggle will be your story right. at some point in the future. And a lot of times the struggle can be a compass, right? Because yes. you don't grow yes. when things are easy. You nope. grow when things are hard. Yep. So when things start to get hard, right? When if say you're going into new waters, right? And suddenly you're like, this is getting really hard. That's good. That means you're starting yeah. to grow. That means you're starting to go into unexplored territory and actually take ground. Right. You might not necessarily succeed in the way you thought, but you no. will come out of the struggle as a, a, a better mm-hmm. person. You'll yeah. come out of it stronger. Right. In the, in the most You're simple... upping those little skills and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. In the, in the most base like level of it is mm-hmm. basically like when you're lifting... Yeah. You're struggling. Right. You're breaking muscle, but at mm-hmm. the end of it, the muscle comes the muscle back stronger. Re, you know, reconnects and everything and yep. grows back stronger. Yep. So, yeah, I think this is a there's a theme throughout the the full bit of this here, is that the 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 struggle is a is a moment to moment thing. There's mm-hmm. all these moments where you'll have the test to stay consistent right. to. Uh, not to to beat the fear of failure, mm-hmm. to keep grit going. Those teeth. Yeah, to grit those teeth, yeah. to keep going past mm-hmm. the kind of dark, confusing tunnel and all that, and yeah, just keep moving forward. You know, that's cool. that's the gist of it. So, guys, yeah, that's that's our podcast. We wanted to give mm-hmm. you a nice, short, and sweet bit there, and uh, yes, yeah, we're gonna we're go gonna into go into some questions. Question uh, if you have any here. questions for the next podcast, leave them in the comments of this one. We'll get to them in the in the next one. Yes. All right. The first question here, guys. You guys sent in so they, many questions. Done. We're gonna try and answer as many as we can. Yeah, we're but, gonna go kind of lightning round. But we're gonna go this. really fast yeah. on some of these. The first question is from CRMG Sec. Is it possible, in your opinion, to make the death of a character that has already died but somehow cheated death, or at least seemed gone for good, only to come back later, once convincing and emotionally impactful? If yes, yes, how. definitely yeah. yes. One of the ways I would do it is I would make it so that I would basically embrace the fact that they always seem to cheat death. So make it be that person where even the reader and the characters know, ah, but they're okay. They're okay. They always come back, you know, come back from horrible situations with a smile on their face. And then suddenly their head gets cut off. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Lex the Graceful Rival asks, how do you include sexuality in the story without it coming across as creepy forced fan service? Ugh, tough. I have not done it yet, so I don't know. Uh, especially when it comes to teenagers, how do you handle it in a mature way? Are there any stories that do this very well in your opinion? Um, I don't know, but when you have teenagers, mm. it's, um, it's yeah, it can be fan servicey, but at the same time, these are teenagers, so what are they going to be preoccupied <laughs> with, right? This, that, is, you this can, is like very present in their mind, so if right. anything, I think asking the questions of a mm-hmm. couple teenagers oh. and maybe figure that out. Uh, so are there, uh, how, how do you, you handle, handle the sexuality of the opposite sex, sex so, so it's realistic and not just the fantasy viewpoint of the other sex and not reality? Okay, so oh. that kind of counters the point I made. Do you have okay. anything for that? I then uh, I think this is a very tough question. I think that you would want to look towards other stories that do this very well. Um, yeah, I can't think of any. I can't think of I, any. Oh, what I would say is that uh, take your time with it, right? Because if, if it because it'll center around the characters um, when it comes right down to it, right? Right. Um, and if you take your time with it, that'll make it feel more real, so that when it does happen, it doesn't have to be like overly dramaticized or whatever. For sure. Uh, Marcus Markson asks, "Where do you guys film your reactions? Right here. Yep. Uh, <laughs> do you guys live with each other? Yes. yes. Uh, when will your Minecraft server become available? Never." Never. <laughs> I- <laughs> <laughs> We're Couldn't insane. Have said it any better myself. Anthony Enzor asks, "What do you guys, in your opinions, believe is the best or most entertaining type of insane character, and why and what is the best way to write said character in a story?" Ooh, you want to take this one? Uh, okay, okay. So, um, what I would say is, 
uh, you don't technically mm-hmm. like insane characters I, I, that much. I tend not to. So I tend not to. What, one right. of the things that I, I really like uh, insane characters are is that it's not that they're insane, it's that they took a passion and they went way too far with it. Oh, so, sure. So, yeah. so there's a character in... Um, Shoot the train, uh, Bacano. Bacano, Bacano. There's a crazy character in Bacano, who is Vlad Russo. Yes, who is very much insane. Yeah, but because he's very passionate about a certain thing. a very certain thing. Yeah. So I love that type of character because even though you aren't going to identify or relate with the character oh. at all, you can relate with uh-huh. basically that aspect of a passion gone just a bit. Right. Too far. Well said, because because what do we say? Make characters care. Yes. And if you have an insane character where the reason that they're insane is because they care way too much, <laughs> that can that that will at very least be interesting. It might not be it might not be a character that people particularly enjoy, but it'll right. be something that'll draw their attention. Yep. And Lex the Graceful Rival has another question. Why do you think most crazy female characters are mostly stalkers slash yandere's? Man, no idea. Seem to have a wider range of personalities from my experience. Okay, here's what mm. I would say. This, I think, it's because um, having good female characters that are just good characters that are female is more of like a newer thing. Mm-hmm. So when people uh, have the idea of having a crazy character that is not just a yandere stalker type character, it's usually because they're trying to explore the idea of the craziness that that character possesses. Because of that, they, I feel, don't have them be female characters as often because their female characters are a list in their head of who are my female characters and I need to make them interesting. Yeah, I also think that a lot of times female characters like this aren't given actual time to develop as characters. So Uh you just show them starting off like this. Right. Uh, Cersei from Game of Thrones is a great example of a crazy character that became crazy. Uh, Yes. She did not start off. Very good reasons. She had things that she was doing that were kind of crazy, but she was not herself a crazy character until a lot of things happened. Yeah. So, uh, next question from Gozi. Any pitfalls to avoid in writing character relationships, dynamics, slash chemistry? And on that note, which pair of characters do you guys think have the best chemistry or have the most interesting dynamic? Um, well, ooh, ooh. well, okay, go well, for it. You, go for you, it. You, okay, well, I would I, say uh, Lawrence and Holo from Spice and Wolf because oh, okay. it does seem like a very discovery-based story and they don't have to deal with a lot of plot to get in the way. It's a lot of just banter and then okay. like, oh, there's some plot mixed in throughout. Yeah, I really like Isaac and Miria from Bacano. Oh, I will yes. keep I will keep showing this yes. couple until the end of time. Yes, they, like if you okay, haven't seen yeah, Bacano, yeah. which a lot of you probably haven't, watch it. Bacano watch it has one of the best on-screen chemistry couples yep. in anime ever. And, and here's the thing, they're a dedicated comic relief yes. like duo. Yes. And we love it. Like like usually that those characters kind of suck because yeah. they're just comic relief, but they make it work so well. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, but are there any pitfalls to avoid? Um, I would say the main thing is only showing them together without them interacting with others. Sure. Mainly meaning that because their interactions are so good, there's this stereotype where you have the twins. Uh-huh. And basically the twins, they just do their twin thing off sure. together. But you never see them really interacting with anyone else. Ocean's Eleven did that in a very poor way, in my opinion. Gotcha. Um, but that's just a that was just off the top of my head yeah, there. Yeah, nice. Uh, Moonstone Pearl. Do you guys have any other siblings besides each other? Yes. yes. We actually have a few. Summer Looney asks, what do you recommend for writers who don't necessarily have a friend group that is a fan of your writing genre? Oh, you have yeah. to go online. Yeah, you have to you go have online. You have to go online. And, and this is really tough because the whole thing of a uh, fan of your writing genre is a big deal because a lot of times when people are editing or yep. reviewing your yep. material, they're actually just trying to change it into something that they enjoy more. Yep. And yeah, got to You can't let them do that. that. You can't let them do that. A good nope. editor or reviewer will try and make your story more of what you want it to be. Yep. Little Duck asks, I remember you guys mentioning the Red Wall series a while back. Mm. Yes. That, what was your favorite book in the series, and what is your favorite food in that series? <laughs> um, I don't have really an answer for the favorite food in that series, uh, but favorite book uh, is probably the one with the Prophecy of Matthias um, mm-hmm. for the first one, because I remember they do a prequel bit of it. I don't remember what the name of the book was actually called. It was so long ago. I read these books when I was like eight years old, so... Uh, what are the books that you read growing up that still love to this day? Uh, Narnia, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, we liked a lot of fantasy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Man Alive, that's another good one by G.K. Chesterton. Hamza Khan asks, is there anything from a show that has made such a big impact on you that has changed your worldview and Ooh. how you acted from then on? 
Well, oh, there's boy. ones that I hope it has done that. Yeah. Um, I, Wolf I, Children I, and A Silent Voice are the two that come to mind. I know that Avatar The Last Airbender did that for me. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah that, the whole idea yeah. of Uncle Iroh and Zuko's story throughout that it's uh, so absolutely good. changed my life. I, yeah. I was able to come out of a lot of like really weird kind of shame pride crap because of oh. that story i think oh and for me with the wolf children and silent voice it's appreciating basically moms especially single moms and then um people with disabilities and com- the importance of communication yeah definitely that's good stuff graham specter asks what are your favorite stories that are carried by or have a strong sense of mood and tone whoa um that's tough Ooh. Ooh. Uh, uh in terms of mood and tone in this corner of the world is a really good one that was a really good one uh, yeah yeah um shoot it's a, there are yeah, some ghibli films out. that i think are like that mm-hmm. um but the thing is those are more themes than right. mood and tone mm-hmm. let's keep going with the questions here how uh, do you think these stories can be done well despite how difficult it must be to have ooh. something as nebulous as tone or mood take, take precedence, precedence in your story, story. Oh, well said okay. that's very yeah. difficult and yeah. i would say the reason that a lot of people see tone and mood as being nebulous is that they mistake like they basically see the effect of the tone and the mood but not actually what that stuff is comprised of right oh, and give gotcha. me it's a lot of the the uh little movements and gestures that they do or or the scenes where they're just eating food you know stuff that doesn't tie into the plot but helps us see these characters doing normal stuff makes us more attached to them sure. um so that's how i would think stories can do it really well when they do stuff like that yeah it, it definitely is taking moments for the little things that's a lot a lot of that comes down to the directing i think especially right. when it comes to anime um but yeah. it's really interesting because when I say when it says strong sense of mood and tone, mm-hmm. a lot of times I need to look actually at the ones that are a little bit more simplistic in their yes. mood and tone because then they can execute it mm-hmm. in a lot more powerful ways. I really love the first couple episodes of My Hero Academia for its yeah. mood and tone. Yeah. Yeah. It does a very good mm-hmm. job of that. And I think right. that that's a combination of the little direction choices that they do but also the music i think that Uh, tone has a connotation to sound just by the word choice of tone yeah um so i think that a silent voice that's another great yeah oh never mind a silent voice beats (laughs) everything oh my god the reason that those things work is because they spend time on the little details and the things that if you were to have like say something like say the lego movie right? right it's so manic that it doesn't spend any time for that stuff all right, Best Boy Todoroki asks, in your opinion, how do you write an ending that makes audiences satisfied? Make you promises and fulfill them. Yep, I was going yeah, to say like, basically that, but I was going to say, like, you are telling them what the ending will be in the beginning. Yeah. And then you make good on that arc. Right. From beginning to middle to end, mm-hmm. and you end it. Yep. Now, I will tell you, this is something that is very, very, like, not a thing nowadays is people will try to drag out an ending to Mm -hmm. milk it for money. And you'll see that in pure, like, kind of episodic, kind of uh, just cookie cutter. You can you can hear the stain coming I, I, I am voice. I am so like ugh, at this but kind that's of why bad ending. Love things it? like Airbender, right? They had a, uh, an ending in mind and they did it, and that was it. Or yeah. a silent voice. You know, they had a very clear story arc that they're doing, and they did it. Yeah, I found that a lot of times movies that are made to be individual movies, and they stay with it, end up having a lot of times the best endings. Sure. Um, uh, also. Uh, an ending is something that can be independent of a like say the general story of something is pretty bad in a lot of ways like not just say it doesn't compare to the ending Mm -hmm. and then the ending can somewhat like redeem redeem Mm -hmm. a a story there's a couple stories out there i know where the ending was so impactful that it made up for a lot of the shortcomings of the story so if anything just set out with your goals in mind of where the ending will be and then actually do that right like that's that's important tanya the future writer how do you (laughs) keep yourself motivated to write even when everyone says you can't motivation is bullcrap yeah yeah i I would say like you are going to you're going to have a rough time trying to keep yourself motivated right um motivation don't worry about it because that's what makes things easy but things aren't going to be easy all the time consistency failure struggle struggle all that stuff is super important so just set daily goals and do it yeah and be accountable it's something that is really tough when everyone around you is saying you can't. Right. I will tell you though that generally your environment is going to be stronger than your willpower. So mm. if you are in an environment that isn't 
isn't uh, conducive for your writing and stuff, you might need to shift things around a little bit or just not let certain things right. into your environment. Yeah. So uh, oftentimes I remember when I was writing or when Jacob was writing, mm -hmm. we wouldn't tell other people that we were writing sure. because we didn't want to risk them becoming mm -hmm. that person that would go, right. you can't write that or let me and, read it. And you're like, no, I don't mm -hmm. want you to read it because yep. you're going to say it's crap. Now, a lot of that is us just being shy mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. because we don't want to share our, our passion and stuff. But if you're actually like in this kind of a situation, mm -hmm. you are going to have a very, very hard time. So, yeah. and, and if it's people like family members and stuff, because that's a lot of times where it hurts the most, yeah. feel free to tell them, hey, no, 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 no saying that to me. I, I'm doing this. Yeah, you, can, yeah. you can say, you can think whatever you want, but right. no, you can't tell me that because then that'll, that'll make me actually, you know, not do it. Right. Uh, Bilgewater Blues asks, if you were summoned to be a master in the Holy Grail War, which famous historical figure, real person or fictional, would you choose as your servant and which class would he or she be? Oh, I love this question. Because here's the thing. This is saying if we were summoned to be the master, uh -huh. not yeah, like yeah. if we were a servant. Right, like, right. Like if we had yeah. to basically uh, mm -hmm. choose a, hi a historical figure, it's really tough because on a lot of levels, mm -hmm. on a lot of levels, yeah. I want someone that would actually be good at fighting. Right. The thing is, in history, a lot of the people that were good at fighting are not, like, great people. So, like, this, <laughs> this is kind of well, a... Well, Alexander the Great got kind of, you know, turned into a cooler person. I know, but, like, servant. But yeah. uh, in a lot of ways, uh, mm -hmm. like, the reason why they had uh, Joan of Arc as their lead in uh -huh. the Fate series, you know? Right. Oh, wait, 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 no, wait, no, she was King Arthur. Arthur. King Arthur, no. sorry, sorry. Mistaken for Joan of Arc. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Saber face was because a Arthur is tied to a lot of legends in right. old folklore. So there's a lot of versions of the story. So you can take uh -huh. a lot of the ways that you want. Whereas if we're doing someone that's like historical fact, like someone well, that's right. But if we that, were taking like a mythic character, like could I choose like Beowulf? Or yeah, like, I was thinking of Beowulf like, too. Yeah, Beowulf like, would be crazy. Yeah. Um, I I almost want to try and find William Wallace. William Wallace would be cool. Like, that would be pretty cool. William Wallace, the legend. Like, not the actual uh -huh. William Wallace. Because right. William Wallace was a Scotsman. And we all know... Scotsmen aren't that tall. <laughs> <laughs> Scotsmen can't wield swords that are right, that big. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. the whole thing of, like, was it more of, like, the seven feet tall and, you know, shoots fireballs from his arse? Or, like, more of the Mel Gibson type William wait, Wallace? Wait, 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 wait. Technically, technically... Uh -huh. If they can do fictional, and but, but if this person historical. just has to be from the past, uh huh. Just just bear okay. with me here. Okay. okay. Star Wars is from a long, long time ago <laughs> in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> my servant. Um, my servant. Who? Bane. I I actually would probably call uh, some kind of a Sith or something like that. Yeah. I I would choose I would choose Revan or something. Okay, okay, yeah. He would he would but, be he would be. Wait, who would he be? I think that I don't think we've had. He would be a saber servant. Yeah, technically, probably, but he could, he be, could be any of them. He could be he could be caster. He could be, well. But the point is, fate. <laughs> it could be anybody. I, I choose Darth Revan. Fine. <laughs> Screw the rules. <laughs> Okay, well then I'd choose like. Well, the point is, I, I'd say William Wallace would be a good one for. Actual I agree. Life. William Wallace would be great for uh, an actual one. Yeah, an actual character. All right. He'd be a saber, you know. Sarah Webb asks, "How can I incorporate humor in a story without it feeling forced?" Make it based around the characters. If you're trying to force in jokes, it will seem like forced in jokes. I'll but tell if you, you the have things characters that... that are funny. Right. Yeah, I I'll tell you when you read someone else's story that you know and you tell them which parts you found funny, they're going to go, wait, that was the right. part you found funny? They're like, that wasn't even intentional. You're like, no, 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 see? Like, there's this mm -hmm. little thing here that ties in with the character, like, design. And they're like, right. they're like oh. Yeah. oh, I guess that is kind of funny. Any joke can get old after a while, but mm -hmm. if you have funny characters, right. then, then you know, it's the egg that, the gift that keeps on giving. Yep. Uh, qu 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 uh, queen. Queen, uh, yes, yeah. gotcha. I tend to have trouble developing a story from beginning to end. How do you suggest I deal with this? By the way, I refer to myself, my username is pronounced Queen. Ah, gotcha. Uh, <laughs> you saw that. <laughs> um, uh, so I would say you get a one sentence summary of how you want it to, uh, you know, of the overall story, and then right. you just basically do it. This is your waifu now. You will be loyal, and you will not cheat on your waifu with another story. Yes, I, I think that. Uh, 
on the side of developing the story from beginning to end once you have the one sentence summary mm-hmm. that he's talking about so like take for an example uh star wars a lone farmer saves the princess and saves the galaxy right. you know it's mm-hmm. pretty basic and stuff yep. but then you go from that and you go how who what where when why right. and then you go outline and you slowly mm-hmm. just add things in over time yep. and then you just write one part of the outline whenever you feel inspired yep. to write that part and there you go. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Antonio, uh, wait, no, 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 no. bloody, bloody claws. claws. Uh, you guys seem to be pretty sad with storytelling and writing in general. Would you be willing to be share a piece of your work to read? I have a book that's going to be coming out in the relative near future. You know, and then you can guys can read it and stuff. You guys can read it. Yep. It'll yep. be great. Uh, Antonio Roja Cortez. Uh, how would a writer portray a character that is more intelligent than them in action? Well, well, I- I'll tell you. This is this is something that's like very fun writing to do, because you basically have a character mm-hmm. that is you want to show that they're more intelligent than than you. Mm-hmm. Give them problems that you don't know how to solve, right? Like, and then spend a lot of and time then spend a lot of time figuring out how right. to solve it. Basically, <laughs> one of the one of the best ways to do this is to make them be kind of a side character that way you don't have to spend too long with them right. and you don't have too close of a perspective to them. Right. That way, because that way you can like polish the little bits that are there. Um, one of the other things is don't just try and make them seem intelligent by having everyone else around them randomly Talking get about... dumber when oh, they interact that too. with them. Yes, like that, that is a very real thing, and the that's, a, that's a very real trap. Can smell through that from a mile away. Yeah. Um, is this uh, the final question? Wow, uh, we went yes. through them quickly. Good job. Horses okay. and dogs uh, asks. I have a character that has two sides, not a split personality of themselves, that's ever expressed. He will switch between the two with a little warning, so he's either quiet and bitter or expressive and goofy. I'm hoping to use this to make the character unpredictable. Long story short, my question is this. Is jumping between these two extreme sides of a main character too drawing for an audience? It can be, but contradictions are amazing if done well. So, right. Well, so I, I think the main thing that you want to see here is break down why the jump happens. If mm-hmm. the jump happens just because you want it to, it's bad. Right. It's bad. You need to give a very innate story reason as to why this happens. Because yes. the reader and the characters around should ask that question internally. Mm-hmm. Why the sudden switch? And then the reader then goes, I'm curious as to why the sudden switch. Mm-hmm. If you do it too many times before you start giving clues as to why the sudden switch, right. the reader will eventually just go, okay, I'm not really interested to, in this. To use one of my sayings from before, uh, with stories, as with life, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. So right. if you want to have a main character that's like this, awesome. But that's going to mean that you're going to have to craft your story in a specific way. Make it so that the story kind of revolves around this whole aspect of this character so that it's an exploration. So the audience knows Mm -hmm. we're going into a story that's exactly like that. That's one of the main points of this story. And then they'll be a lot more open to it. And just make sure you handle it. One of my favorite character archetypes is the hero playing the fool. It's basically there's there's a bunch of comedies out there and a bunch of like serious stories out there where there's a plot reason as to why this character shifts between playing the fool to some people and to other people they play the the right. hero the, and, the and I can do everything kind and of it person. might be something where they actually are that way or they are like intentionally doing that mm-hmm. but you, both have awesome, both have tons of merit yeah awesome merit one of the common ones is that you'll have someone that's like a like the Podrix, you know from like game of right. thrones that are the squire that are like uh, i don't know what to do I'm but so then when and stuff. yeah but then when push comes to shove <laughs> then they're like okay all right yeah let's do this and then they suddenly start like being really helpful and everything what's funny is that there's a connotation there that i don't know if you know about because you might not have seen every part of game of thrones but i think you do there's another part where podrick kind yes. of steps up uh-huh. to the uh the plate pod the rod pod the rod yeah yes I, yeah yeah oh yeah yeah, praise the, the tower. <laughs> well, and that's one of the funniest moments, like in, in Game, Game of, of Thrones, Thrones right? like, like because they were able to do that. They're so, like, what this shy, like, just random boy, mm-hmm. just they were like so happy, right? They so, gave him the money back. <laughs> yeah. So come up with a one sentence summary, say for the character to explain this contradiction in their two right. different like versions of themselves. Yep. So that it's easily communicated, so that the audience can grab onto it and be like, "Yes, I get what's going on." That way, when it happens, they're not thrown by it, but instead they're like, "Okay, this is cool." Yeah, because you can do that at least once. 
Like you can mm-hmm. throw them kind of in right. the beginning. And then but it's the, like, okay, this is... But then you need to yeah. unpack it slowly mm-hmm. over time at the yep. very least. Like right. you can unpack it all at once too, which might be even safer, mm-hmm. but unpack it. At right. some level. And that's why a lot of times these kinds of characters are side characters because then they don't have to spend as much time with it. You just see it and accept it because you right. don't spend that much time with them. But right. for a main character, you need to be a lot more careful. Yeah, I think of like Alex Louise Armstrong in Full Moon Alchemist Brotherhood. Yeah. He tears off his shirt. He's like, come let me embrace you with my manliness. And then they have the other side of him where he's like, you... You yeah. know, like he, yeah. he gets all serious all right. of a sudden. Yep. Or right. or he's crying holding or yes, a dead body. he goes all of a sudden like mm-hmm. emotional and right. like yeah. really soft yep. and yep. all that. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Good question. Yeah, great question. Yep. I, I say more characters with contradictions done well are needed yep. in storytelling. Mm-hmm. So yeah, guys, that was our podcast forty one yes. Q and A and everything, guys. As we said previously, leave your questions mm-hmm. in the comments down below and we'll answer them in a future podcast. Yeah. There were if, a bunch we didn't get to in this one because we were like, okay, there's a lot. Yeah, there were so many. Yeah. So be sure to uh, repeat your question mm-hmm. if it didn't get answered. Ask them as concisely as possible. Yes. That helps a lot too. That does help. Yeah. That does help a lot. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll see you guys uh, later in uh, Podcast 42. Yeah. But until then, we're Semblance of Sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And we'll see you all... Next time. time.